<laughs> Where do you start with Mustang? My gosh, it's an icon. It's a car that's one of only few cars that have actually stayed in production for 50 years. It's a very unique car for Ford. It has to do everything on the edge. It's not just Mustang, it's a 50-year Mustang. 50 years of just incredible history. There's so much to draw from. People across the globe love Mustang for what it is. Even growing up in, in the UK, we all knew what Mustang was, and it stood for freedom. And It was high performance, but it was at a, an affordable price. This is the 50th anniversary, so this is huge. The main inspiration of the war to be used was creating this badass Mustang. Like a fist just coming through. The 50th anniversary of the Mustang, you only get it once. There's about four of us who started the project February 2009. Well, the process starts with our team, our marketing team, talking about what we need to do to develop the 50th anniversary, what the customer is looking for, how we can improve the vehicle. We talked to consumers, we talked to owners. We wanted to know what it was about their cars that really appealed to them. We tried to deliver with this car all, that, all the passion that we heard from the consumers. We found out that certain things that we said we couldn't change, we had to change. Certain things we wanted to change, we had to change even more. We didn't want the car to look retro, we still wanted it to feel modern. That was the state of the art then. We have to deliver the state of the art now for the car to be accepted as a modern car. It always starts with the sketch. So, well, it actually it starts in the designer's mind and then it's translated into a sketch. Sometimes when you do a sketch, it looks really dramatic. So I think for us it was very important to capture this emotion and this exaggerating sketch like you see behind me. What we try to emphasize on this sketch is basically this, this strong shoulders and this really tiny waistline. We pull the wheel inch per side in basically to emphasize this strong haunch and this beautiful rear shoulder as well. Some of the, the real passion parts of this car were this rear haunch. You know, we really sweated this. I mean, th th this area here, I would say we probably redid I don't know, I guess 50 times. We said the 1967 Mustang, that is definitely inspiration we'd want to take, is the fastback. We actually took the entire cabin, you can imagine, and we shifted it about three inches rearward. It's more selfish to the driver, has a very long hood, the car is lower, the car is wider. The car, I would say, is actually even meaner. They go through their selection process, then we start with four tenths models. You'd have maybe 10 different versions of cars and dramatically different. Then we go to a full-size model and we just keep working those things down until you end up with the finished product. If you're talking about a finished model balanced to this level here, you're talking probably 10 days, two weeks. Basically what I try to do is duplicate the surfaces that the sculptor has created. There's a lot of limitations that most people don't even realize, like the uh, width of the vehicle can only be so wide so that they can fit it through, you know, certain portions of the factory. And, you know, there's all kinds of different limitations. You know, there's a few significant elements in the Mustang, which like the shark bite nose, for example, the shark nose, the tri wide tail lamps, and the fastback, which we said from, from the beginning, we want to need, we need that in the new Mustang. You know, you can have a great look, side view, rear view, all that. But then the real test is when we check the highlights. The light sources should be just like razor sharp. Any kind of change in body surface, those lines should be just perfect. We agonize over the details of the surface so that it looks athletic and organic. The interior wasn't styled, it was designed. What is essential? We kind of stripped away a lot of the extra styling cues that are typically can burden an interior and kind of mix the message a bit. So making the theme very aircraft inspired, that was difficult to sell because today's car is very, it's general. It's good, but it's general. It doesn't have a, a very clear message. This one does. This is a Mustang, but it's obvious that this is an instrument too. To get there, we, we did multiple themes. We had to make some hard decisions like this theme or that theme. We chose this one because of those reasons. A lot of stages where, you know, you have 30 designers competing for one, you know, goal. Very com competitive process, but, you know, that's how you get the best design out of it. We know that every Mustang has to have some inviolables, things that, that have to be in every interior. We know it needed to have a symmetrical instrument panel. We knew it needed to have the double brow theme that you've seen on many Mustangs, harking clear back to 67. 
We definitely wanted the large round analog gauges in front of the driver and we wanted honest premium materials. Those had to be in the vehicle. So as we're going through the sketching phase and looking at what people are putting together, the ideas that we're getting from designers, they had to kind of go through that filter. Then we could start really taking a look at what was cool, what was neat, what was something that was taking it to the next level but still keeping it a Mustang. This is my sketch. When you look at the 64, they have a dual pod. So I wanted to put that in there, first of all. The second was 67, has the, uh, the finish panel rolling down. So I thought that was so cool. And, and you never see that anywhere after that car. So I wanted to put that in there as well. I wasn't born and raised in, in the United States. It was hard for me to understand the, the history of the Mustang. For me, I had to study the, 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 uh, the Mustang. What is the Mustang? So I had bought books and read. First I sketch different views, you know, plan views, side views, and hand it over to the clay modelers. And they'll take it over and they'll look at it and then they, they're the masters in 3D. I, I'm, I'm good at 2D, make sure it's beautiful and cool sketches. Those are the guys who make it 3D. When you're spending the kind of money they spend to build a car like this, you have to be able to show management a physical property. The designers give us their sketches and their ideas. We're responsible for turning those surfaces into feel and good highlights and proper dimensions and working side by side with the design team. It's got to be hands on. You got to be versatile to go in there in the process and start working with these guys, demonstrating. You know, if you can't show them what you want, maybe it can't work out. Can we do it? Here, let me, give me a shot, maybe I can, so. To be able to work with a designer, you can't, you gotta have a little bit of a tough skin. Some of the guys are a little bit, you know, a little bit more honest than others. <laughs> we heat this clay up to approximately 130 degrees so it's workable. If we wanna make some changes to the surface, we smear some clay on with our fingers. And then we start out with our roughing tools and we can sit here and start sculpting. This is you know, nice flat surface, but it needs some surfacing. So I've got some teeth on here and I just kind of come down and I start working it down. And typically when you're working big surfaces, you use big tools. Small surfaces, you use small tools. Just as if I was drawing lines, I draw the tool in to create that shape that I'm looking for. Then we can start working with some finer tools and develop that and then we'll shave it with our steels which we can bend to form shapes that we're trying to achieve and we can get these radiuses on the corners. The elements that become a little bit more difficult are obviously anything that we've got contours. Like anything like this here, if I was to put foil on that side, you'd see these highlights just puddle perfectly you know, in, the, you know, in the valley of this, this surface. We do make a lot of our own tools. Sometimes we'll make a tool just for one particular section of the model that we're working on. Simple things like a block of wood that we can turn into a clay plane, pieces of steel and sharpen them down and bent wires. This is a, it's just fiberglass and it sounds crazy but it actually works really good. And if the designer says, we have a management review and they say, this whole front end needs to be changed. We tape it off, within a day, I can have something roughed in for them to come in the next day and look at and say, okay, now yeah, that's looking better. We're changing some of the process, like this speaker grill here, this is grown on a 3D printer. We can't get that kind of detail, and our digital sculptors can create that and put that honeycomb and those things in there, and we can put that three-dimensional part in our clay model, which really makes our models look better. But we still have to have the clay to develop the feel and the surfaces that we desire in these models. From an interior perspective, I think there was an aha moment for us. We added a new technology to this vehicle that's, that's a first for Ford, which is called an active glove box door, which means the airbag module itself, instead of being positioned below the instrument panel, it's actually part of the glove box itself, so it's encapsulated in the door. It took a tremendous amount of room out of the IP. If you look at today's car, this hangs down like this. It's that much thicker, so being able to do this and then accentuate right through this core just totally streamlined everything. And, you know, they talk about proportions on the exterior. Proportions are just as much important as they are on the interior as well. I think that really totally transformed this and gave us the core of what we were working with as far as this aeronautic theme. I don't want to do like Frankenstein kind of patchy here. I just want to blend it in so well that it's meant for the whole design. Some area people might even notice. I spent 
like months just to figure out how to make this. The console and that interface into the center stack, that was hard because there's so much information there and to get that shifting dynamic right, because the current car doesn't quite get it, but we had to offset things. The shifter itself now is, is, is here, but the cup holders are shifted over to the, towards the passenger side instead of right behind the shifter. So it just creates a much better experience for the driver to drive. As far as the Mustang, what we did is we created more personalities. These four colors, black, white, ingot silver, and magnetic are our core colors. Probably the highest take rates in the industry. We have also other impactful colors. For example, our guard. The team wasn't so sure about how this would translate onto the vehicle, but it is absolutely beautiful. We kind of pushed for it and we said, this is gonna be perfect. We'd look at it in the models and they're going, oh, I don't know, but it is beautiful. We call out all the grains. So everything you touch and feel, um, there's a texture to it. And that texture came from us. You change the finish of this material, it totally transforms the feel of the interior into something else. For me, I mean, it, the looks of the car is obviously important, but I think one of the biggest things is the fact that they brought back the four-cylinder. Getting a four-cylinder back in the car, I know people think that's inherently wrong. We did it back in the 80s, um, had it for the SVO. That car is fun. The first question everybody within Ford was asking is, well, how do you make it sound like a Mustang? What are possibilities with a four-cylinder turbo? Uh, we actually put together some sound concepts uh, using some uh, simulation tools that we have. And then we took those sound concepts out to uh, some enthusiast customer clinics. It kind of helped guide me a little bit on which direction I needed to go. We'll set the targets for how a car has to sound and feel. And then we'll kind of do some backward math to tell the engine guys, here's what we need for sound and vibration out of the engine. Sound quality just has to do with the character of the car, but it also includes trying to suppress a lot of the noises that you don't want to hear. So you get kind of a, a clean backdrop for the character building sound that you want the customer to just be enveloped in. We deal with everything ride, steering, and handling related. We decide the attribute, and what kind of performance we want, and the design team helps us deliver that. We have the same goal, which is to build the best car we can build. We know what they want, and, and it's the same thing that we want, and as engineers, we figure out how to enable that. And I think, you know, a little bit of tension between the two groups is good. That just means that you're doing a great product. Yeah, everybody works in an area that it's kind of like their own business, and so you have to convince these other people that this is really important and that we can do it. And, and I'm not just gonna throw something over the wall at you and walk away and just let you swim in something, you know. We all have to work together. There's influence in this car for sure, but as far as the engineering goes, these cars are not like the old cars. This is the latest and greatest engineering. This is technology at its finest. And this car can do things that the old car couldn't dream of doing. The addition of the EcoBoost engine, power and performance. If we don't compromise on power, we don't compromise on fuel uh, performance and world-class fuel economy. And on top of that, we have mated this with one of the best independent rear suspension we have done in this company, a purpose-built independent rear suspension just for the Mustang. Our V8 performance pack is a second faster than the old Base Boss 302 around a racetrack. One of the big things we're able to prove is the braking performance of this vehicle compared to the last, that you can go drive deeper into the brake zone than the, than the previous car. In the manufacturing end of it, every build phase is always a challenge. Every, every time you go through a new variant, you're, you're catching, you know, what are the latest defects that we have to get through, right? How do we identify as much stuff as we can identify so that when I do hand it off to the plant, that it just runs. You know, we always want to give people what they love to do, but make it a little bit easier on them. Well, one of the most fun features I would say is line lock. That's the ability to, through your steering wheel controls, you can actually do a massive burnout. We lock the front wheels for you. <laughs> I have to say it's for track use only, wink, wink. Everywhere we go, everybody wants us to do a burnout, right? You're only supposed to do that, you know, in a, in a control environment, and obviously it's illegal to do that on the streets. Well, every variant of this car has got its own customer. You know, I want the image of a Mustang, but I want fuel economy, fuel economy and performance mixed. Or if you just want flat out, give me the torque, just smoke the tires to all end, yeah, you can do that too. We get to see what's coming out in three to four years time. I mean, it doesn't get much cooler than that. You know, because you're on top of it, you're all over it. Until I saw it next to the current car on the road, the 14, then it was like, wow. You just see how much different it really is. A car looks so much more planted than the previous generation. 
less lines on the car, but very powerful lines, which describe the Mustang. This is a Mustang, no doubt about it. It's quite a, an exciting thing to be in charge of, of actually developing next generation Mustangs, and I feel very proud and honored to be in that position. Once in a lifetime opportunity to design a Mustang. I'm pretty sure I'll be in the, one of those books that I bought. <laughs> you know, maybe in, in my name will be the, in there as well, but I hope that's the case. I enjoy it every day. I think we produce the best car that I've ever worked on. Standing next to this, how would you feel? How many people get to do this and, and I'm a part of it? My favorite part of the car, it's not like something you hold in your hands or you look at. To me, it's that overall experience. They're gonna feel this connection to this car from 50 years ago. It was exciting to drive then and it's exciting to drive now. You don't get a car like the Mustang by taking no for an answer. If you're passionate about cars and you have you have a talent for drawing, then this is, this is the industry that you need to be in. We are all enthusiasts, but you have to have uh, the technical expertise to back it up. Pencil on paper, that's what it comes down to. Can you communicate what you can with your hand on paper first? To be able to come up with an idea and have conviction and, and want to stand behind it, but also be able to sell it. Clay modeling is a kind of a real niche field, but it's not a, a field that's going away. And if anybody wants to get into it, I would recommend going to art school as I did. If you really believe that this is the job you want to do, there is way, there is schools. Yeah, this is what I loved when I was a kid. And uh, you just follow your dreams. It sounds cheesy, but it's true. Follow your dreams and you work hard. If you have those skills and you have those passions, we will find you in the end.